Today we will be opening a box of Battle for Zendikar. Ash is here with me. Hello. Yep. Um, if you guys can't hear us this well, just give us a no in the chat. We're trying a little bit of a new setup for this unboxing. Um, recently I was given a pack from a friend, uh, for family members actually, and it happened to have a Jace in it, so I turned in the Jace some of the cards to get a box of Battle for Zendikar. Um, and we're going to open this today. And look at the stuff. Um, for each pack, we're going to talk about the first picks. Uh, Ash is going to be here for with us for a while, kind of talking about her view as a new player and which cards look cool, which cards are kind of weird, right? I mean, for a lot of people, uh, if you've been playing Magic for a while, you kind of take for granted what the cards do or how they work out. But for a lot of new people, it's really exciting. And I like how Battle for Zendikar as a limited format is a good fusion of a really fast set in the original Zendikar and a really slow set in Rise. So here we go. Um, let me see if I can find a spot to open this with spinning Gideons. I can, I can do it. Uh, uh, take that plastic. Very dramatic. All right, okay. So. Oh. Look at all the packs. We got the Gideon. Look at him. Oh, I got a Sarol. Yeah. So the cool thing about Gideon is um, I think he's of Middle Eastern descent, is what they said the race was that. So, like, them having more than just white people races is a pretty cool thing for humans, like, representing all the different races in the Earth. Um, we got Kiora. She's a merfolk. Merfolk aren't people. Well, they're not human people. They're they're fish people. The, the ally, um, that's the, the, I think, the one green white ally that has the uh, power and toughness equal number of creature control and you can tap allies to get abilities obnixilis he's kind of mean uh let's see some uh some, some scary looking eldrazi fella i think this is the one that's the five five for six that if you uh process two cards it becomes a nine nine i'm trying to just see if there's any other sort of like things looking on i think those are the main ones there i'm surprised ulamog doesn't have itself on a pack anyway we're gonna move this over here we're going to open one pack at a time. We're going to talk about first picks and a little bit of what the cards look like. So, you know, as you guys, if you have any questions, just let me know if you can't hear me well or if it's hard to see something or if anything's a little bit odd. Um, Ash, we're going to open all those as we keep going. So just keep those stacked up there. And actually, let's pull all the cards out of here because we're going to put the uh, the cards back into this box so I have a way to transport them home. We're actually at Brad's house. As you guys can see, a Merch Strider is our first card. And then um, I think I'm also going to delegate Ash to official trash holder. Okay, you want to put the box right here? Okay. We're doing some setup stuff on the side. Okay. And then a billion packs over here. Right, put the trash there. Okay. So, Merch Strider. Um, I've enjoyed the processor deck. I don't think that it's a particularly exciting deck to start off a first pick with something like that. There's a hand you crush, just put them in the box. Sludge Caller, we talked about this overperformed for a 1-1-for-1, one, one one, not great. Plummet's a sideboard card. Salvage Drone. I really enjoy Lithomancer's Focus. There's not very many um, one, or there's not many combat tricks in this set, but one uh, converted cost mana trick, or combat tricks are always really good in normal sets anyway. And just paying 1 for plus 2 plus 2 would usually be enough outside of green for sure. Giant Growth is an A-plus combat trick. And paying 1 for plus 2 plus 2 and any sort of other bonus is, is usually very solid. I think Outnumber is the first card I'd consider picking here. Um, so Touch of the Void versus Outnumber is interesting. I think that the more powerful pick overall is Outnumber. It's instant speed. It can do more damage. And I actually think that it's strong enough that I would uh, usually pick it over Touch of the Void, even though it does do a consistent amount of damage and it exiles. First pick, I'd probably take the uh, Outnumber over it which is odd. Usually you wouldn't, but this set actually is kind of slow, so you have a chance to do that. All right. I'm not going to mention all of these cards, just the ones I think are good first picks so far. I think it's still the outnumber, even over the McKinney Slide Runner. All right, here we go. Stasis Snare is the new front runner. This card's exciting. Um, so I think that the, the Stasis Snare is A-plus removal, and I'd always be excited to have that. And we got some more viewers. Hello, viewers. Uh, a Rot Shambler is a card that I'd be willing to pick a little bit later, can go in a lot of different decks. Um, 
with the different scions, you can often sack to make this guy bigger. I had him at the pre-release in a couple other drafts. I was impressed with him. Ulamog's Nullifier, I think, is a more powerful card in of itself than Stasis Snare, but I'll take the Stasis Snare because it is single colors, and this requires two colors and a deck, um, although usually if you're in blue-black, you're usually in the uh, processing deck. Gruesome Slaughter is a not particularly powerful rare, but it's fine. I wouldn't say I'm excited about it. I think I'd take the Stasis Snare. In fact, I would definitely take the Stasis Snare out of this pack. Oh, it's the spawns, the little angry squids. So yeah, Stasis Snare is one of the best cards out there. I think it's going to usually beat a lot of other cards. It's Unconditional removal. Let's go on to the next pack of old Ob here. Obs. So Ash is looking for the things. Ash, if you see anything cool or anything that stands out about a card that you want to mention, uh, just let me know, and we'll go and, you know, let you tell us about it. Give us kind of your first impressions, because this is her first time really looking at the set. Okay. All right. So in the second pack here, we start with a uh, Nakana Assassin. Uh, again, this is... Oh, let's see if I can get this to focus right. There we go. This is a card I don't mind having in the life gain deck. There is the life gain black-white um, pseudo-ally, mostly life gain deck. I think this is one of the worst cards in it, because the death touch doesn't matter much, because there's not that many ways to give... Instant speed lifelink, and the deck is more mid-range and a little bit more defensive than offensive. That said, you know, it's fine to get through with. Tandem Tactics is one of the... All right, let's see if we can put some more of this. Is getting focusing well. Okay, this might be a little bit better. Tandem Tactics is one of the combat tricks I am excited for. I think it's probably the best combat trick in the, se the set. That said, I'm probably not going to pick a combat trick first. And there's the second best one. Sure, Strike is slightly worse, but only slightly than Tandem Tacket Tactics. Evolving Wilds is a high pick for a lot of decks. It's a, a glue in several different decks. Green, red, landfall likes it. The multicolored decks, a lot of the decks like it. Um, I'm not going to take it first. Sky Spawner is a card I'd be very happy to take first. It's, uh, in my opinion, the best common. Yeah, I'll take it over all of the common removal included. Just making the two bodies, one of which is evasive and the other which can ramp and they can block, does a lot of work. Again, better than Bone Splinter, still a very good card. I'm usually happy to First pick it. There's a lot of incidental bodies that make it better. We're just going to pass cards I don't think are that good. Speaking of not that good, na Unnatural Aggression is one of the reasons I think green is not as strong as it often is. Um, three mana is a lot just to fight. Even if it is at instant speed and even if it does exile, it's just not usually what you want to be doing. All these land effects, all the lands with um, each of the battlefield effects, all of them are super solid. Uh, I like the Vigilance one. It usually lets you not necessarily get a quote-unquote free attack in, because the plus one, plus one doesn't usually push it up to that range, but what it does do is it allows you to leave back a blocker, and that can make a big difference there. Uh, Herald of Kozilek. This is the kind of card that I wouldn't take first, but if I see third or fourth, I'll start looking to move into the uh, blue-red sort of processor control-ish mid-range deck. It's a powerful card, um, and it's a, a big sign when you see a card like this go a little bit later than it should. That said, I want to start with something like the Sky Spawner, even if the Sky Spawner was a little bit weaker of a blue card, just because um, you, you have to make sure that you're getting enough cards to play, and starting with a two-color card isn't always the best idea. Um, Encircling Fissure puts a little bit of pressure on Sky Spawner, for which you'd prefer. It is also the smallest Awaken card. I think it's the only Awaken 2 card, which is kind of cool. Um, I'll probably pass on this, just because... Most of the white decks are aggressive, and this fits best into the defensive white deck if you have it. All right, so I'm taking the Tide Collar over the Sky Spawner, and I would actually say of these two cards, often the Sky Spawner is going to go into more decks, but the Tide Collar is just so much more powerful for the deck that you're going to play it in. So if you end up in the uh, Awaken X, usually it's Blue White Awaken deck. Halimer Tide Collar is awesome. You can play most of the Awaken spells early for nothing if you have one or two of these. Lands having flying makes them almost unblockable. It's super powerful. That's a really crazy card. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, just like the mobility. All the land creatures you control have flying for three yep. is in of itself like really crazy. But then you also get to return something with a similar... Yeah. That's That that to me just comes out as like one of the, uh, a mind-blowing kind of card. It's just like, why is this here? How does this not break the game? Well, 
So Ash is again hasn't seen that many awakened cards. Uh, the awakened cards have a cheap upfront cost and a more expensive awakened cost in which one of your lands becomes a two two three three four four. There's a couple fives and six, but they're usually twos and threes and a couple fours, which is a powerful effect. Um, but again, the this the floor on this card, the lowest end, is just a two three for three, which is not that great, but it's fine. Let's go into Angelic Captain. So this is a powerful card. Five for a four three flying is usually good enough. I still think I'm taking the Halimar or Tide Color over it, and in fact. I'd probably take the Sky Spawner, just because I don't want to take a two-color card this early, especially when there's uh, good alternatives in other colors. Hey, we got a Foil Full Art Land. That's exciting. So for those that didn't know, the Foil Full Art Lands are selling for a decent bit. I think they're like three or four or five bucks. So yay, four or five bucks. And then the other lands here, a Dragon. Let's go into our next pack. We'll have Gideon and his Mighty Searle join us. If you guys have any thoughts about uh, the picks that I make, or what we talk about prospectively for first picks, go ahead and let us know. Like, if you like the first pick, or you disagree, if you took the Angelic Captain, or you took the Sky Spawner, you know. All right, so we have a lot of packs. I'm not really gonna, oh, let me get this to focus. Focus! I'm not gonna talk about the picks I don't think are worth picking or noting. Now, let's say Fortified Rampart is notable. Usually this card would be unplayable in this set. Um, you're gonna get it late, you're gonna wait for it to wheel. But it can be a strong part in your defensive white deck, which is usually white blue. So don't be surprised to put a one or two of these in your main board. I was wheeling. Uh, remember when we draft? We start with the fifteen cards, and then it goes around the table. Gotcha. Right. It wheels around, and it's still in the pack. Belligerent rope tails okay, but not great. Oh wow, another sky spawner. This would be another great pack. So I would put this one to the front. I think it's better than ruin processor, which requires us to be in a deck. I, I think it's better than bone splinters, just because of. Needing the creature and also the two bodies, which are evasive. Brood Hunter Worm is a card that's going down in my estimation. I think it's only really shines in the red green landfall deck um, because it's the only deck that really wants just sort of a mid range creature. So many of these decks are synergy based. They want your a bunch of kind of okay ish cards working together to promote a very strong um, deck and card synergies. And this card doesn't have any specific synergies, but as a 4-3 for a 4, I'd still be happy with it. Mortuary Mire is, in my opinion, the best of all of the base or common uh, lands that with effects. Getting another card back is just really powerful. Zulaport Cutthroat's another really strong card. I wouldn't take it over the Sky Spawner, but when it's powerful, it's one of the more powerful um, sort of synergy-based cards you can play. This with the other ally that whenever an ally comes into play, your opponent loses one life and you gain one. You can be in a situation where when any ally comes into play, your opponent loses one, you drain one, and whenever something dies, so they can quickly kill them. Unified Front is a powerful card that we're not going to be picking over that. I still think we're still on the Sky Spawner. Spawning Bed and Sky Spawner are close. Now, I would still stick with the Sky Spawner, and the reason for that is it'll go any blue deck I play. The Spawning Dead will go in any deck I play, but it won't quite be as good unless I'm in a certain set of decks, and those decks are ones that will continuously get to six mana and have some way to put great use to the one ones. Any deck could use the three one ones. Any deck would you be happy to use its kind of free land slots if it has any for Spawning Bed, but I think I take the Sky Spawner over that. And then I take the Coom Hellkite, obviously, over the Sky Spawner, but uh, talking about rares is a lot less interesting. You know, sometimes your rare is just awesome, that's it, sure, whatever. Um, this is fine. The double red doesn't make me shy away, even though I'm less likely to play an Akum Hellkite than I am an Eldrazi Sky Spawner in my deck. The power level totally justifies the pick. It's an island! It's another squiddy, spawny, token dude. Alright, time for the next pack of Rise of the Male Drazis. The Postal. Oh, that's my joke. Eldrazi's Postal, yeah, A+. plus. Another Narcan Assassin, not exciting. Seek the Wilds, I, I don't mind playing it. I've come around a lot on Seek the Wilds and Anticipate. Um, this format doesn't have many two drops, and having something proactive to do on turn two is nice, just sculpting your hand slightly. Um, so the tempo is a little bit less important in this set than many other sets, usually. Don't be afraid to sideboard them out if you mainboard them, or sideboard them in, it, or... Yeah, board them in if you're uh, sideboarding them. Oracle of Dust is fine. I'm not excited about it. Or Alter's Reap. Cards garbage. Garbagey one drop. All right, Seer Drop. Now we have a card to pick. Yay, Seer Drop. This is a card you'll always play in your white decks. Um, even my aggressive white decks, I'm running one or two usually, especially with um, some of the decks, depending on just a couple big threats, you can just turn it around. 
All right, Valakul cool Invoker, I don't think it's as good as Sheer Drop, but it's a card that I'm excited to have in most of my red decks, aggressive red decks. It gives you a mana sink. Uh, bolting for eight damage, or sorry, eight mana is still great. And the floor on it is, you know, a 2-3, which is not great, but is serviceable. All right, here is a two-colored card I am willing to go in on. This is the best of all of the uh, two-colored cards at Uncommon. Catacomb Sifter is the kind of card that pays you off hugely if you can cast it. And the uh, opportunity cost of just losing, uh, what was that card? A Sheer Drop it, it is moderate, but the fact of the matter is that uh, Catacomb Sifter is one of the best creatures in the entire set. Um, and the fact that you can take it now and p probably play it is really good. Green and black actually are two of the less drafted colors. That said, Vile Aggregate is a card that might push me off of that. I like this card quite a bit too, starting with it is extremely powerful in the, uh, usually in the blue-red processor deck, just because it can get this. This can be a 3-3, three, 4-4, three, four, four, sometimes even a 5-5 five, five by turn 4 or 5 very easily. That's very strong. Uh, Malakar Familiar, wow, these are all all-stars here. We've got three cards that I'd really like to pick, and I actually might end up taking... I think I'm still on the Catacomb Sister. It's so good if you can play it that I don't think I can pass it, but these two other cards, the Valigate and the uh, Familiar, the Vile Aggregate and the Familiar, are definite first pick quality cards. You'd be very happy to have either of them. Flying and Death Touch is a potent combo. I don't mind Munda Ambush Leader. Not excited about it. This isn't the kind of first card that makes me want to go into allies, just because I'm not sure if I want to play two-color allies. He does help ensure you're going to get more ally drops if you have a decent mount, but that's only okay. Oh, we got a foil ally encampment. I'm not going to pick it, but that's cool. All right, and then more spawn buddies. Okay. So in that one, I was definitely on the catacomb sliver. Sil blech, sifter, just because it's such a high power level. If you do get to play it, it'll make your deck excellent. Earth and Arms. I'm down on this. Like, this card is not good... In my opinion, I don't want to pay 7 for a 6-6 six, six or a 4-4 four, four that puts two counters on. And the other mode is, like, very likely to get killed. Even if they don't have instant speed removal, getting an extra 2 damage, or if you could swing in another 4 damage in, is only okay. I, I don't like playing cards like this unless I absolutely have to. And if I'm having to do that, I'm probably not in a great spot. All right, so we've talked about all these. Remember, Volcanic Upheaval is an okay card to sideboard in if your opponent's playing a lot of Awaken spells, because it does kill that stuff. If they're playing a three-color Awaken deck, you can take them off of creature lands, or you can take them off of uh, colors. I don't mind Angelic Gift. I haven't really found the deck for it other than um, wide X allies. It, it's okay. There's just not any one-drops I want to put it on. Um, but it does cycle, and it does give evasion. The Spires are solid. Grave Birthing is another card that's solid in it. You're going to pick it up later, just because there's not a, an immediate home for it in your deck. You don't want to commit this early to being in the uh, processor deck. Eyeless Watcher is a card I'll take. This is a decent bit of ramp. It's a decent bit of body. So this goes into the green ramp deck. Um, but also, it goes into the allies go wide strategy with the uh, green allies that pump up all your guys, because it gives you three bodies. So I like Eyeless Watcher. I like it more than Eldrazi Devastrator. I like it more than Weave. Ugh. Wave Wing Elemental, which is a fine card. You can just get them later. You don't need to pick them up early. Angel of Renewal is a card that I would consider over the Eyeless Watcher. It's a nice payoff card. Gaining life um, for all your allies. It can go in your ally deck. It can go in your blue-white controlling deck. It can go a lot of them. So it's, it's up in there in those. Pilgrim's Eye is good. I'm not going to pick it this early, but if I end up in a three-color strategy, I will often look up pick them aggressively. Royal Spout is another... I think it's the second best two-color card of the set. Uh, three to uh, put a creature on top of the library is fine. I would usually play that card. The fact that you can awaken it for six and get a four-four is very impressive. Hey, it's a Smoldering Marsh. That's not a particularly good card to pick up, but it's a good card for my collection. So uh, this is a tougher one. Royal Spout, Angel Renewer, and Eyeless Watcher all make good picks. Um, my first pick... I think I would be probably not starting with the Royal Spout. I do think it's the strongest of all three of these cards, but these two cards are strong enough that I would consider either of them. And I think I'm probably leaning towards the Angel of Renewal just because I like the I like white a little bit more than green in general. Uh, there's only a couple of key green cards, but white's a little bit more flexible and with the amount of removal in it. You can often get in a great deck. Let's open up a... Uh, Fish lady. 
busting up the fish lady. Brad will be joining us in a couple minutes. Brilliant Spectrum. I'm not big on this one. Um, I do like the art on it. I just don't think that you can converge high enough for it to be good consistently enough. Call of the Scions is a card I would consider first picking if the rest of the pack was kind of weak. Um, so, interesting point. The, uh, the Life Spring Druid, the two green for the two one that taps for mana of any color, versus the Call of the Scions. Call of the Scions is more explosive ramp. It's better than the dedicated ramp deck. But the fact that the green ramp deck can go into a converge deck, it, um, which is usually like converge allies or converge control. It can go into a lot of different directions. First pick, I'd rather have the permanent source of any color of mana as opposed to two bodies. Um, that said, this is the higher floor, higher lower ceiling. Sorry, lower floor, higher ceiling card. Royal Mage's trick is fine, but I'm not gonna take it early. Castigator is okay. Not excited about that. Reckless Cohort is a card that has overperformed. It's better than you think. If you're in the ally deck, it's usually just a 2-2 two, two for 2, and you're usually beating down, so that downside is only okay. And there's Life String Druid, which I'm going to put over here uh, in front of the uh, Call of the Scions, as I think that I would take that first, just because it's more flexible. Mm. Gideon's Reproach versus Life Spring Druid is a little bit interesting. I'm not sure which way I'd go on that one. I think I'd probably start with the Reproach... Just having a powerful card like that, uh, the Vestige Miracle is fine. It's one of these sort of pivot cards. You can play it in um, the red-blue processor deck, and it's okay. You can play it in the black-red Devoid deck, and it's okay, but it doesn't excel in either. I'd rather start with a Vile Aggregate or one of the aggressive black cards than I would the Vestige. So I usually go for, with my early picks, for the stronger card that's dedicated in the strategy, just because synergy is so important as opposed to what you would normally do in a set like Origins, where it would be the opposite, and you'd be rewarded for picking your colors. In this format, I think you're picking a deck. So so decks, not profit. De decks, not colors as much. That said, you can lean too far. Processor Assault's a great example of that. It's the kind of card I'm going to wait for me to wheel, and that's, you know, not even sure if I want a powerful card, but the setup cost is very high. I'm out on slab. I'm, ooh, real sorry, let's set this over here. Defiant Bloodlord is 7 for a 4-5, which is not exciting, so I'll pass on that as well. So that leaves us at Royal Spout or Gideon's Reproach. Both powerful cards. Um, they kind of... They're both strong white cards. I think I would go with the Royal Spout over the Gideon's Reproach. And um, the real part behind that is that I think Royal Spout is just that much stronger of a card... But I'm not sure if that's the right pick. Let's go on to this next pack. Ooh, that good pack opening sound. We have worked our way through like a tenth of the packs. Giant Mantis! This is, ooh, let's get it to focus. Focus. Focus, camera son. I can do that. I used to teach martial arts. Oh, man, it's really not one to focus right now, huh? Did it focus it on my hand? It was doing so well before, camera. Let's give it a second. And back. That's even blurrier. There, there we go. go. Um, I would take a giant mantis. I'd hope not to. I take it over and anticipate. I take it over a mind raker. Uh, I think sure strike is leading the pack, but I'm not really excited to take that early. Brood hunter is leading the pack. Spell Shrivel is a playable card, by the way. Um, most of the creatures you're going to be countering, most of the spells you're going to be countering are creatures. The Exile can be relevant. I'm not going to take it early, but I don't mind playing it. Complete Disregard is the uh, Forerunner. The fact that you can just exile a creature at instant speed is great. It's better than Rune Processor. Uh, it's better than Retreats. I'm still kind of down on these. They're playable, but not excellent. All right. We've gotten there. Uh... Probably tied for first with the best multicolored card. Drana's Emissary is extremely powerful. Um, it plays offense by dealing three a turn, essentially. And it plays defense by blocking pretty well, but also just continually draining your opponent even if it can't block. Uh, that said, Wind Rider Patrol is definitely the pick over it. The cards are roughly the same power level, and this is just a single colored card, which is much, much stronger. Um, this is the kind of card that if you can get a hit or two in, the game is probably over just due to your card advantage. Hey, it's a Cinder Glade. That's exciting. And let's go on to the next pack. More fish ladies. 
Brad is filling his belly with food, and he'll be uh, come over here with a little bit of color commentary. Ash, have you seen anything that looked interesting, mechanics, or anything that kind of stood out to you? Um, past the fifth pack. Um, I did have a question about um, emblems exactly, and um, because I see those on some planeswalkers, it says you gain an emblem, but what exactly is an emblem? Is it a token? Is it like an enchantment? Okay, so that's an interesting and good question. Most things in magic are temporary effects, like sorceries and instants. They go away once that happens, it's until a turn effect. Or you get counters, or you get uh, an aura, or you get an enchantment that says these things happen. And emblems are like counters on the board. They're weird. They come from Planeswalkers exclusively. And those emblems create a permanent effect on the board. Usually it's represented with like a token. Oh, like this emblem right here. So you'd use the ability, it would give the emblem, and then the emblem will stay on the battlefield, but it's not a permanent, it's just a reminder that the battlefield has fundamentally changed. Um, this effect is always happening, and there's no way to get rid of it. So it's, it's a little awkward at first. Um, I'm not sure how much of a fan mechanically I am of emblems. Wizards had said at the moment that they'll never fi have a way to get rid of them. We don't know if that's true or not. Um, if emblems just stick to planeswalkers, it's not particularly important to. Very few emblems count for very much in tournament play. So, uh, just because it's so hard to get to them, usually. A couple cards are easier, too. So, emblems are kind of like a permanent, continuous effect that is on the side of the game without being a permanent. It's not an enchantment or an artifact. It's just something that has altered the game. And usually, if you have an emblem, if you have a Planeswalker that makes an emblem, um, you want to get an emblem card, or you want to write out your own emblem card, kind of customize your own on some construction paper or something, make it look cool, but have the text on it so you can always have it down on the board so people don't forget. Okay. All right, let's see if we can get it to focus. Focus. Yeah. I'm out on that. Mist Intruder has shot up in my picks. I'm not going to pick it first, but if you are in the processor deck, you do want to pick up Mist Intruders fairly highly. Benthonic, in Benthonic Infiltrators are better, but they're not as abundant. I'm not high on any of these cards. So we don't have a first pick yet. <laughs> I guess it's Shatter Skull Recruit. Ah, Kozlux Channeler. There we go. I have a first pick. I take this, not be excited about it. I'd consider the slide runner over it, but I prefer the channeler and more decks. Courier Griffin's one of those cards that looks like it goes into a lot of decks, but it really does only like, goes into the life gain deck and maybe the blue white awaken deck. Skitterson's really good in the black red deck, but I don't think I'd commit to this card that early just because it's so bad in so many other decks. Coastal Discovery may be probably not the best uncommon. Hey, Tinsy. But it's up there. The fact that you can get three cards for six mana or two cards for four, it's very powerful. It's either Coastal Discovery or Grip of Desolation is my favorite uncommon that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, it's certainly not Pathway Ath Arrows. Barrage, Bar Barrage Tyrant's fine. Um, yeah, so Coastal Discovery. Uh, if you see this card, if you see this card past the first... Oh, come well, on. Well, I can't see it. It's not focused. Focus. Focus. Man. This camera's doing so good. Okay, I think it's redone it. Yeah. If you see Coastal Discovery, anything past like the first or second pick, it's a good sign that blue's open, and I would definitely go into it for that. Um, the card is very potent. And having the fail safe of just four draw two cards is fine, but the option to have that third card, of one, which is a four four, is great. Speaking of great, Anticipate is only mediocre. Oh, come on, let's focus. A little better. Oh, come on. We got this. You can do it. All right, Sledge Caller, no reason to focus for you. Nettle Drone. This is the kind of card that I will first pick. It is very good in the... Um, wow. It goes in a couple different decks. I think it's powerful in the Processor decks as an indirect way to do damage. It's powerful in the Black Red deck. I think it's good in every single Red deck. And it's great in a couple of them. I think it's one of the few cards that's both flexible and powerful. Ah. That said, I would take complete disregard over it. Um, still on complete disregard. Yeah. Um, Hedron Archive versus complete disregard is interesting. Complete disregard actually goes into more decks, even though it's just black. But I don't mind Hedron Archive. It's got a lot of... Um, oh, how do I put this? It's got a lot of potential. It obviously slots in best into the uh, into the ramp deck. 
but you can put it in a couple other decks that are very mana hungry, the processing decks. And the fact that you can sacrifice it to draw two cards is a big boon on it. Um, Zada Hedron Grinder is a cool card. I don't think it's particularly powerful. That said, if you're running the ally deck, I'd run it. And if you're running a deck with one or two combat tricks that can take advantage of it, which is probably the ally, possibly a landslide deck, I'd still run it. Four for a 3-3 three, three with big upside when it comes up, but usually no upside. It's pretty good. And then we got a Planes and All Octopus. Ah, let's go through here. Oh, oh, I can see something. It's a voracious null. All right. So just to remind my uh, new viewers here on Mobius Pick, if you guys have any thing to say about the picks I made, if you were like, you know, I don't think that Royal Spout was the card to take. I think that Sky Spawner was better or something. Type it in chat, and I'll try to respond. And, you know, hear you out. I mean, again, this is a new format. So figuring out what the correct picks are can be kind of tough. Um, figuring out which cards are the depth of each color is a big deal too. Right now, I'm basically on green being the worst color, but only by a little bit just because it only has two really good strategies. We'll talk more about that on another one though. Let's look at these picks. I don't have any picks so far because these cards are not worth first picking. Fertile Thicket's my first pick. This card does more work. Um than most people think. First of all, it's a May ability, whether you want to look at it, but you always want to look because you can look at the top five cards and rule out the cards that you're not going to be able to draw. So I don't need a land. I look at the top five cards, and I know that I have two possible removal spells I could draw, and I see neither of them. I know that I can still draw either, or I see one of them. It gives you a small amount of information. You have to remember, but it's on the bottom of your deck. Or, you know, to let you keep a one or two land hand and turn it into a two or three land hand. Um, I'm taking Snapping Gnarled first. It's one of the more powerful, aggressive creatures. Taking it over Evolving Wilds. Taking the Sky Spawn. This guy's been coming up everywhere, man. He's just so good. Sharpshooter's potent, but I'm still on the uh, Sky Spawner. Uh, you're not focusing. Yeah. Uh, Bane of Belagid is a fine ramp target. It's a little bit weak in that um, it has a 5 toughness. But if you can ramp it out, your opponent can't usually afford to exile lands. They, so they usually have to exile some creatures, which can make it survive. And, you know, unless your opponent's playing a Scion-based deck, they usually don't have permanents just to throw away. So it's usually worth it. Planar Outburst is my pick, just because Wraths are great. Um, in aggressive decks, Wraths are good because you can have them as a backup plan. You can put out three or four threats and beat down and have your opponent start committing to the board more while you... Dock up cards in your hand, and then eventually just drop your Planar Outburst. And the fact that it can awaken is a big bone, too. Alright, Planar Outburst. Um, in a moment, Brad will be coming over here and going through the, pulling the rares up front, and all the value cards. When we finish here, we'll kind of show you all the cool value we got out of this, and you guys can decide if you want to buy a Battle for Zender card box. The Expeditions really help bring up that price, although they are fairly rare. The same slightly more likely to get an expedition than it is to get a foil mythic. But I'm sure we'll have a first pick in here. None of these cards. Kozlik Sentinel, maybe. Eh, I don't mind it. It's still Kozlik Sentinel, though. Ah. Ghostly Sentinel is one of these cards that goes in the blue-white based um, Awaken deck, and I know it doesn't seem like that would at first, but most of the other decks want synergy cards, and the fact that there's just not that many synergies to go with a 3 thief flying vigilance just by itself means that it usually is just going in that deck. Benthic Infiltrator is my current first pick. Over in Grove Rumbler. Over Breaker of Armies, which is one of the better cards to go in for uh, the ramp, but I always pick up the ramp first and the fatties later. Molten Nursery, you can build around. It's been growing on me. I thought it was definitely too weak. I think at this point, if you have one wheel, you can take it. Uh, especially if it's a relatively free pick. If you can get two or three, then you're in a good spot because they stack up pretty well. All right, so Amara Shepherd versus Benthic Infiltrator. And I'm definitely taking the Shepherd, even though it does require quite a bit of mana just because the payoff is so high. Oh, it's the Core Ally. The Core Ally. We got the ability of Rally. We got the Core Allies. Other bad jokes. Core Level Guide. This card I'm still pretty high on. It goes in a lot of different decks. Uh, Blue-based sort of... Let's see if we can get it to focus. Real good. Blue-based ramp decks are good. It's good in the ally deck. It's, it's really good in just any deck because being a 2-1 for 2 is solid in this format. 
And being able to make things unblockable is also quite nice. Stalwart is a fine card, but this actually usually goes in the uh, two or three color ally deck. This is a reason to be base green or green white uh, allies. So we're still on the Coral Hum Guide. Over the Snapping Gnarlet, even though Snapping Gnarlet's a more aggressive card, the uh, upside to this card in the late game is much higher. And the ally part is nice as well. It's a big part of it. Marasa Ranger is the kind of card that you'll be fine to play, but I don't recommend starting high on it. Uh, there's not just a generic green beatdown deck other than the Landfall deck. And this fits okay into it, but only okay. It does cost you four mana just to get those counters. Resolute Blade Man Master is one of the reasons to be in the ally deck. If I see this coming around fourth or fifth pick, makes me want to kind of lean over towards allies. Um, I could see picking it over Core Home Guide. I probably wouldn't, just because this is a fine and strong finisher in the ally deck, but I prefer to see that allies is open before I commit to a two-color card that only gets in one deck. Blighted Fin is a great card to start if you can afford it in your mana base, and to sideboard in, even if you can't, if your opponent's playing a big creature-based deck. This is Renewal. It's not a playable rare. And on to the next pack. Do you have a question on that card? Yeah, why exactly do you call that unplayable? Is because of the high cost and the low? So why is Nessus Renewal is unplayable? Now, first of all, I'm talking about limited. In Constructed, there may be a combo deck that does that. Paying 6 mana to get 3 landfall triggers seems like a decent thing if you're playing a landfall deck, but that's usually just plus 3, plus 3 on it. 2-2 two, two or 2-1, two, so you're making a 5-5 five, five on turn 6, that's not good enough. Um, if you're playing one of the ramp decks, most of your targets you ramp to cost 6 or 7, so usually you don't need to get to 9 or 10 mana. The life gain's nice, but very often this card isn't ramping you into the 4 and 5 mana spells that you need to play to stay alive. It's ramping you from 6 to 10, and even if you have 10 mana cards, I'd just rather have a removal spell than something that's usually going to be stuck in my hand. All right. Prove it. It's a great cyborg card, by the way. Calastria Healer is a card that's been growing on me. If you see these wheeling, you can go in the black-white um, ally healing deck. It's fairly powerful. Uh, it's this really nice, grindy deck that can often beat a lot of the other decks. Remember, a lot of the big Eldrazi's don't have Trample, and a lot of your other black-white cards have two or three toughness. Or sorry, yeah, between... 3 to 5 toughness, and two, uh, 1 to 4 power, so they can kind of trade well with the aggressive decks. Nettle Drone is my current first pick. I think it's great. I think it's better than uh, Vestige of Emrakul, even though if one more mana gets you 3 more toughness and trample, being able to deal 1 damage, which makes it go well into the sort of more controlling decks, and also being able to untap it with the color spells means it goes well into the black-red deck. I'll take Gideon's Reproach, probably over Nettle Drone, although it's close. I will take Gideon's Reproach over Touch of the Void, certainly. I'll take Sheer Drop over all of those cards. Fire Manto Mage is one of the more important allies in the aggressive decks. It just prevents your opponent from blocking, and often it allows you to set up a situation where they're going to lose multiple creatures, and you'll be left with multiple creatures. All right. And I think I'm taking Endless One over Sheer Drop just because it fits anywhere on the curve. It's not great at any specific number, but the fact that this is a two drop if you have a hand that curves out three up or that it's your card that just fits in any slot is very nice. I really like the flexibility of this card, and I might not take it over all... I might take it over almost all the uncommons. I can't think of an uncommon I would take over this first pick just because it's so flexible. Dragons! That's the back of this token. Territorial Bailoff. I'm a little cooler on this card than Brad. Brad likes it quite a bit. I think it's just fine. Um, just being a 6-6 six, six is nice. But I need a little bit more out of my cards. Um, oh, let's get some to focus. Brad and Somehow I thought I was going to be on camera, but apparently I could have just wandered over here while eating. Yeah, <clears throat> Brad's right here with us. Um, in a Once we get close to the packs, Brad's actually going to go through and pull up all of the rares, and I think foil lands so we can see all the value, but not yet. Right well, now we've we're... been somewhat sorting these. Mm, Ash is uh, not. I'm going to start doing that. Okay. All right, uh, but 
back to first picks and whatnot, whatnot. So right now I don't think I have a particular first pick. I would take the bail off of that, but neither of those are exciting first picks. We're looking for a deck where we can emphasize synergy over just one raw powerful card. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that's how the, the format's breaking out. Like, Origins is all about just making the best pick over and over and being in the right color. I think this is about being in the right deck, right? I mean, me and Brad could be right next to each other, and we could both be playing white, and if he's the inspired charge white deck, and I'm the sheer drop white deck, we're picking completely different cards, usually. Um, I, I actually don't think that there's an inspired charge specific deck. It goes okay in green-white allies. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't drafted all that many strategies. However, I... I don't know if allies is that powerful. It's fine. There's multiple allies based decks. Uh, Stone Fury is a card I'd be happy to first pick. I think I would pick Stone Fury over Smite, even with the double cost. I'm still on Stone Fury over Channeler, over Miasma. I like, I like Channeler pretty high, but maybe not as a first pick. Obviously, if you're building that deck, that's what you want. Um, I like Serene Stewart in the life gain deck, but I'm not going to take that first either. I do like the Channeler's open. Oh, well, never mind. All that's all over because Coastal Discovery is definitely the pick. In fact, I think that if you're at the Pro Tour, uh, Coastal Discovery is just better than Kiora. Really? Yeah, this is a two-color card, and the first you two abilities... Assume, assuming you're not in those colors already, right? Yeah, first pick, first pack. Do you take Coastal Discovery or take Kiora? i probably take Kiora. Uh, it's really powerful if you get it down. Why? The first ability just untaps a creature in a land, which is fine, but not great. I mean, it basically gives something Vigilance and untaps the land. And then the second ability does let you draw two cards, but this card is usually drawing you two cards and making a 4-4, four -four, and you're not really getting into ultimate. Um, that's an interesting pick, though. All right. Matt's telling us to give a little bit of hustle. Are you doing all the cards one by one? Uh, no, a lot of the other cards that we've seen, I'm just skipping. Just talking about what the first pick is. Like, you know... Swarm Surge. That's a card that you can play as a finisher in the deck once you already have the deck set. I'm going to get this focus. <laughs> focus. Let's see if it focuses. A little bit better. I mean, it will focus. There we go. That's ah, not that good of a focus. There we go. I wish there was a button. To, to autofocus? Yeah. All right, Call of the Science is the first pick currently. There we go. Sometimes it'll focus on my hand. So Call of the Scions, again, a card that is f decently strong. I would take the Scions over the Predator. Predator's a better aggressive card, but I prefer the Scion decks. I think that's a personal preference thing more than anything else. Uh, Rolling Thunder is now the pick. We actually yep. have a great card. This is actually the best uncommon in the set, I think. I believe you're right. Mm. I like this guy, too, but I would probably take Rolling Thunder over it unless I wasn't in green. Oh, this is your first pick, so you'd have to choose uh, Deathless oh, Behemoth. Okay, so you're only doing first picks. You're not. Yep, just first picks. Okay, you're not. You're not talking about how if you're in nope. Eldrazi deck, that one's really good. That one's really good. No, I would take the Wasteland Strangler, not over Rolling Thunder. I think Rolling Thunder. Oh, I would. I would take the Wasteland Strangler. Just because. No, no, I would take the Rolling Thunder over Wasteland Strangler. Well, yeah, but if you're not in red, you obviously don't take. That. Swarm Surge is powerful if you are in the colorless based deck, but it needs you to be in that deck. And then it is a fairly replaceable card overall. Um, I think we should probably just have the next pack ready for you. Sounds good. So All right, I'll, Brad, I'll I have pushed something, and you. the screen is doing something over here. Doesn't matter. They don't see that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> It'll stop. Good. Rolling Thunder is one of those cards that's going to go into any red deck you're playing. Um, and it's not hard to be in red. Or any colors. Tightening Coils. I like it. I'm not... As high on it as other people, just because it's bad removal if you end up in a blue aggressive deck, unless it's a blue flying deck. That said, it's still the first pick right now. I think it's better than all of these cards, including Royal's Retribution, which is more powerful in the ceiling of how good it can be, but the floor is just much lower as well. It costs so much mana. Void and 10, it's fine, but not a first pick. All right, I'll, I'll take the Ornery Reef Hydra, even though it's not, like, backbreakingly awesome or anything. It does get big, and it's hard. it can't be chump blocked because of Trample. All right. Oh, wow, we're streamlining this, guys. New pick, new pack. I'm on Coral Helm Guide. Uh, we talked about that earlier in the stream, but it plays well early. It plays well late. It plays well in multiple different strategies. It's one of the few flexible and powerful cards. I like it more than I do... No, I like Bone Splinters better than I like um, the Quorum Home Guide. Just because 
it's unconditional removal. Well, not unconditional. You need a creature, but that's not usually too hard to do in most of these. So we're on that. It's better than Scour from Existence, which I've found only playable in the ramp decks and only maybe as a one of. You'd rather not play any. Um, Bone Splinters, I think I take over the Entanglers. Just, this is a powerful card, and this is an even more powerful card. I think I take the War Caller. Just, if you end up playing Allies, this is the best Ally card. If you see this card, second, third, fourth, you should go into Allies. This is the best Ally. Um, and it's the best card to put into any sort of go-wide deck. So, Tyru War Caller. I take it over Fathom Feeder, too, which I think is... Oh, yeah. This is getting ready. I think Fathom Feeder is a very powerful card. I would take it over a lot of other ones. Being a 2-mana 1-1 one, one Death Touch with the Void is nice. The Death Touch is nice. Drawing cards is nice. And Jest is nice. But just committing to two colors for a powerful card when I have a slightly, in fact, more powerful card. But even if it was slightly less, I would take the uh, one color 8 out of 10 over the two color 9 or 10 out of 10. Or Reef Invoker is fine. I'm just not excited to take it. I don't want to be there early. None of these cards are particularly exciting so far. Oh, okay, so I'm on Invoker, but that's a pretty bad first pick. I'm on the Angel, that's a decent first pick. All right, so I think that was our worst pack with the Angel being the best card. Uh, we're going through here. Yeah, I mean, you can probably tell what those cards are about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've seen all these cards right here. Um, again, the commons. This is the first time we've seen Boiling Earth. This is one of the only Awakened cards that you can't main deck, and one of the only ones that I don't actually bring inside deck that much. It's just not quite what I want. Gideon's Reproach. I've got a first pick, and it's still Gideon's Reproach. I consider Brood Monitor, but I'd be out on it. Um, six mana ramp cards, not where I want to be. This actually puts you more into a go-wide or super big strategy, and I'd rather have cheaper cards for either one. Um, I like Bl Blighted Cataract. You can't play it super early, though. You can't pick it super early just because you have to have... You only have so many land slots, and I'd rather have a strong card like Quarantine Field. An easy first pick. All right. It's another Dispel we're starting off. Man. All right, let's see if we can get a good focus on this. It'll happen. Just... Start flipping through. Most of those cards they don't want to see anymore. Maybe people want to see Colossian Night Watch is the first time they've seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe they'd have it looked at the whole spoiler in the three weeks. Maybe not. I mean, they want to see the excitement of maybe we'll all open a Feldar Cub. I don't have a first pick so far, by the way. Eyeless Watcher is my first pick. And that is actually, I would prefer that over Brood Monitor, even though it's less powerful, just because it costs four. And I don't mind ramping four to seven. Uh, I think while it, I would pick that over Rush of Ice, I do like that card way more than you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I think I might pick Silent Skimmer over Eyeless Watcher. I've been very impressed with the card. Plays offense well, plays defense well, hard yeah. to kill. We were very harsh on that in the review, but I saw it do work every time I played. Yeah. Um, I think Akum Stone Waker is good, too, but I'm on Silent Skimmer. I'm on Silent Skimmer on that pack. Not. I haven't seen many exciting rares. Uh, we got a bunch of the lands. That's great. All right, Incubator Drone. There's my first pick. I think it's one of the first ones we've seen. Rares or yeah, rares and foil lands. Okay, rares are the red ones, right? Red or orange. Red or orange. So yep. No silver, no bronze, right? No. Okay. All right, Life Spring Druids. Probably my first pick here. Undo Rising is a card that is actually a five mana four four with haste. It gives your guys life link instead of has a two mana form of give all your guys life link and be an okay card. Um, I think I'm on Life Spring Druid over Carrier Thrall, but it's moderately close. I, I prefer the flexibility of the green card. March of the Tomb. That card's not really particularly exciting. That was another kind of weak pack. You'll get them every once in a while, though. Uh, the, the actual power level of this entire set is a little bit more flattened out to emphasize the synergy-based decks, because if the base cards were more powerful, then you wouldn't play synergy-based decks as much. Call of Scions is my leader right now. Nettle Drone is my leader. Um... Looks like it might just be Nettle Drone. None of these cards are coming up on Nettle Drone. Yeah. Everybody was uh, complaining at the Pro Tour that there wasn't much Battle for Syndicar. Um, I think that Khan... Oh, in all fairness to the Pro Tour, there were the lands. And that was a big deal. People played those lands. And those are that's Battle for Zendikar. Until Khan rotates out, you can expect to see three and four color decks with Battle of Zendikar mana base. Like, that's what it is. When it rotates, we will have... 
less powerful cards than the all gold set with perfect mana, you know? I mean, other than the mono red decks, there's not too many decks that are going to be playing one color. Um, I guess I'm first picking Shatter Skull Recruit we saw earlier. That's not exciting. Snapping Gnarlid? I'm on Snapping Gnarlid. I'm on Tide Drifter. So we're going to talk about this just for a second. I think that both of the um, Blue to Void pump cards are great. Tide Drifter buys you time, makes your Scions more durable, makes your other Devoid cards, which is a lot more uh, durable. And you can often be like 90 or 100% Devoid. So this will give that buff to all or almost all of your creatures. Very strong card, this one and the uh, Ruination Guide. And I'm still on Tide Drifter. Uh, I'm on Smothering Abomination. It, it's more powerful, requires a little bit more work around it, but the fact that you can get a couple spawns out, hit a couple times with your 4-3, and then near the end sacrifice it to draw a card if you haven't already won, makes it very solid. Oh, I got a Foil Sludge Crawler. My dreams are come true. Uh, Abzan won the Pro Tour, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. I was pretty sure that was it. Um, the two Japanese gentlemen went to the finals and had up five matches of Dark Jeskai versus Abzan. But you guys can go back and watch it. That's on the uh, YouTube at Wizards. You can watch all that stuff. There's some really exciting stuff going on in there. A lot of four-colored decks were played. I still don't have a first pick, by the way. You can watch drafting that. You can watch the pros draft and see what they think. Um, me and the pros may sometimes disagree. Um, it's also important to remember that not all the pros draft a lot. Some of the pros are bad at drafting, but some of the pros are awesome. Yeah. Uh, all of them can play well, though. That's important when you draft. They can all play well. Some of them draft poorly and play well and manage to lose to other pros that played just as well or slightly worse and draft better. I'm on Beastmaster. I like this guy as um, a decent first pick for allies. Mm, I also I, like Demon's Grasp. I would take Demon's Grasp. I don't know. See, it's hard to always call your first pick because, you know. It's, it's not because you know that this is the only card in relation to it by itself. I actually think I'd take the Beastmaster over the Demon's Grasp because Demon's Grasp is bottom tier removal, whereas Beastmaster is mid tier ally card. Like, I would be happy to have a Beastmaster in my deck. And I don't mind playing Demon's Grasp, but I look to cut it, right? You know what I mean? Hmm. That makes sense. All right, but let's go to Turn Against, which is actually my pick because I... He just loves this card, I, and for good reason. It is good. It's both a removal spell and a, uh, a damage spell. Yeah, it does a lot of work there, and I think it's going to be our first pick. It is. And I'm not unhappy with that, though. Uh, most of these packs have been pretty good. We've had, like, a decent first pick. It's the second, third, fourth, and fifth picks where this really starts falling off. Like, we'll count how many powerful cards we have this pack. One, Core Helm Guide, which is our first pick right now. Two, Brood Hunter Worm. Three, Complete Disregard. Four, Turn Against. This has been a good pack. I'm on Turn Against still. Five, Blight Herder. Okay, so there's only five really good cards. Um, Blight Herder's the pick, just because, you know, it's a very powerful rare. So y you can't expect to see a lot of cards going very far, right? If we were doing the same thing, but imagine we're doing like fifth picks. In some sets, your fifth picks are going to be fairly strong. In this set, you need to be figuring out what kind of deck you're in because your fifth pick is going to look really unimpressive unless it's surrounded by the correct cards. All right, so right now we don't have a first pick. We've got some really, really bad picks. All right, we've got Benefic Infiltrator. I'm excited about that. Touch of Void. Um, good. I prefer the Infiltrator. Just It holds up a big wall, and it's good in all of the blue decks. I actually take it over Stone Fury. Stone Fury is... Ooh, come on. Let's see. Stone Fury is a powerful removal spell, but costing double red and not being able to play early, um, it's better against the bigger creatures and the smaller creatures. Um, I, don't, I think it's very good. I just think I highly invent... I highly... Uh, value Benthic Infiltrator. Oh. Higher than Plated Crusher, which is a solid card, but it only goes in one deck, really. And it's good there. Uh, I take the Deathless Behemoth over all of those cards, though. Including Shri Shrine of the Forsaken Gorge, which is not particularly impressive. All right, so we've gotten to maybe my pick for my favorite common, Clutch of Currents, the uh, Awaken 3, or sorry, 4 blue Awaken 3 uh, bouncy card. Brad, do you think that this is your first card? Favorite common you can think of? I think it might be the best. 
Um, At least in tempo favorite decks. Favorite random common? I think there's some that Mana Ramp that I'd rather have as a first pick, but I'm trying to force Eldrazi every time. So. Okay. I'm real high on Clutch of Currents. Possibly too high, but I know that all of these cards are not even close. I'm definitely not trying to pick you know random spells like, like we're seeing now as my first card. That guy is a really good common, though. So, I mean, you do commit to blue. Okay, well, let's say, which of these blue either cards? Either one. You know what? Sky Spawner's better than either, so we know that's true. Benthic Infiltrator versus Clutch of Currents is an interesting one. I think I would take the creature over the clutch. No, the clutch is a creature, too. It's a 5-mana 3-3 three, three, the bounce is a card. Yeah, but it's primarily a bounce spell. I actually think you're this gonna is... get a three three for five, and you're gonna get to bounce one of their creatures. It was a huge tempo play. I'm on the Benthic Infiltrator. Uh, well, actually, I'm on the that, grip now. This, this guy, that grip is good. Uh, yeah, the grip might be the best. I'm not sure if you take Grip of Desolation or uh, Rolling Thunder first, and that's insane. Just because this set is so, just because exiling a land so often is a card, and exiling a creature can be worth the mana. Um, it's hard to say. I know it's six mana grips better. All right, Unified Front. So I'm on Grip of Desolation. It's going to be really hard. I don't know how many cards are better in the set than Grip of Desolation. It might be none. I'm not sure. Oh, they're uncommons? They're, all of the cards in the set. Can you imagine a card that's better than Grip of Desolation or Rolling Thunder? There might be a couple I mean, of rares. Gideon's probably, probably Okay, better. yeah, Most Gideon's. Most of the Mythics. Or at least half of the mythics. Some of the mythics. Gideon definitely is. I mean, Gideon is also worse, worth more than anything else in the set. So that's not true. Just We've got that. expeditions. Uh, Sky Spawner is my in current the pick. Set. <laughs> not added to the packs. All right, so we're still on Sky Spawner. The Sky Spawner's been a pick a lot, uh, but you know I have said it is the best common, so that does mean it's going to be the pick a lot of the time. Um, I think I take the Sky Spawner over Radiant Flames just because I don't want to commit to Converge my first pick. Even if it is only converging with two, the red deck often is aggressive. So unless you end up in the sort of blue-red version, you're just not going to play it. I really like it, the incubator. Yeah, I'd be happy to take that. Not happy. I would be fine to take that first. It would be in the middle. I would take out number over it. Uh, incubator is more often going to be a solid card in your deck, but out number usually does at least two damage. And I would take shock over incubator, so I take out number over it. Take shock. Outnumber over Smite, over Kozilix, over Touch of the Void. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That the fact that, you know, Touch of the Void does always do three mana, three damage. But Outnumber usually does at least two, can do more, and does it at instant speed. It's one of those situations where the floor is slightly um, lower on the card, but the ceiling is way higher. Titan's Presence is a card that I pick up late if I'm in the Devoid deck. So we're on Outnumber, which is fine. Um, it's not a particularly exciting first pick. Uh, I'm on Oracle of Dust. I'm not really on that. Right now I'm on no first pick. I'm on Outnumber again. I really like the last Spring Druid. I could see picking it over Outnumber. I'm going to pick the Outnumber usually over it. But I could go back and forth on that. Uh, it just depends on what deck you're looking to do or what deck you're more comfortable with. Too. Remember, your pick orders can depend on that. Uh, I think Tunneling Geopede is better than Outnumber. I think it's better than any of those cards just because it's a 3-2 three, for 3, and that's fine. But also, the fact that the Landfall deals 1 damage to each... Uh, oh, it's each opponent, not each creature. Never mind. Still fine. Uh, never. I, I think I might be on Outnumber then instead. I misread that card. Sorry, guys. Uh, yep, I'm on Outnumber over Lumbering Falls, too. I'm on Clutch of Currents, and I'm happy. Um, Clutch of Currents... So I think my favorite color in this set is blue. Like, why well, I keep mine, saying... Mine too. I keep saying, this might be one of the best commons, and I've said that for a lot of blue cards. That's a good sign. What makes a color the best color in limited is how many good commons you had. Let's say that white had all the best rares and all the worst commons. Would you want to be in white, Brad? Not really, because unless you get one of those good rares, there's probably only a couple of them. Well, yeah, I mean, the other problem is even if you get four or five good rares, like, how many cards are in your deck? More than four or five. Um, so we're on the clutch. The clutch is clutch. Don't, don't ever say that again. I, I only said it that one time, but I might say it again someday. Nope. All right, so we're not really seeing anything's beating the clutch. That makes sense, though. It's one of the more powerful cards. I am... See, I really like this card, because it is a 4-6 with lifelink. And I was going to say, I'm going to take this over the clutch of currents. The, the, game, the winning life clause doesn't matter. You'll usually kill them by then. 
But six yeah. for a force. The thing is, it's not as big as an Eldrazi, and it doesn't flop. It's a really weird place to be in in this set. Well, I mean, if you're in white, you'll usually have a way to answer one or two Eldrazi's. If you've been gaining any amount of life, you'll have enough life cushion to take a hit from the Eldrazi so you can kill it with, you know, a Shear Drop or something. And this holds off the entire, all of the aggro and mid-range decks. The Landfall deck, the Ally deck, none of them can really get through a 4-6, and they can't Alpha Swing through you gaining 4 life and killing their best attacker. Yep, it's pretty awesome. I like oh, that is that a foil? Foil Cliffside Lookout! Look out, it's a foil cliffside lookout. Uh, how much many more packs do we got? Um, Just a couple, including right? Including the one in your hand, five. Uh, we're in the final stretch. Looks like we are not going to open Only, the uh, yeah. expedition. Well, statistically, we were not likely to open an expedition. We weren't open this for the expeditions. We we're open this for the excitement. Should talk about first picks. Right now it's Bone Splinters. I enjoy Bone Splinters. It's not particularly big and fearsome but it's a solid role player in your deck ruination guide um i'm taking ruination guide over bone splitters just because it goes so well in all of the blue base decks most of them are devoid and um this guy plays real well with the other scions yeah, he's also a three through for three if he does nothing else so. so this is an interesting one ugin's insight over ruination guide i think i'm on ruination guide just because it's more consistent but Ugin's Insight is one of the cards where if I'm in another deck for it, I will pick it very highly. And that's just more of a controlling blue deck. Alright, so I'm on Clutch of Currents again. So at this point, you've got 15 Clutches. I've got Clutches and Sky Spawners. I've got the world's best mono blue deck. It's going to be awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. you open a box and build a deck. Um, I think that I'm on Benefic Infiltrator over Clutch, just because it's a 3-mana creature versus a 5-mana creature. I think I'm on Touch of the Void over Benefic Infiltrator. Um, would I take Outnumber, Benefic Infiltrator, or Clutch of Currents? I think it's Outnumber. So here's here's where I want to talk about something in this pack. A lot of people are going to see this Mythic, and they're going to Windmill Slam it on the table, and they're going to not look at the rest of the pack. And while that's, that's fine if you're just playing at your local store, you might want to actually look to see what you're taking next. Because I'm taking the Omnixilis out of this pack. It's a mythic. If I get to it, it's going to rock. It's also probably worth a bit of money. It may even pay for the draft. All right. So so earlier I said I would take Coastal Discovery over um, Kiora in a non-financial sense. I think it's a better oh, card. Oh, yeah. And if you're at your local game store, you're probably taking this. Yeah. In fact, you might take this anyway. Um, I think that power level-wise, it's great. As a Planeswalker, this is never dead. Like, nope. the only way that this card doesn't get you out of losing the game or putting you further ahead is if you're playing against the go-wide small decks. If you're playing well, a Drazi deck... If you're almost dead, he is not going to single-handedly save you unless they have one big creature. Well, if you have a board state, let's say you have a couple 2-2s two or 2-3, two, yeah, I mean, if, and they've if got no Drazi... there's nothing that can save you, there's nothing that can save you. There's a good chance this will stabilize the board and put you ahead. Yeah, it, All it, in one card. If this card couldn't save you, the only other card in the set that usually would would be a Wrath. Yep. So anyway, uh, at your local game store, yeah, you probably should take that, but do look at the rest of the pack, because they will come back around, some of them, and you don't want to sit there for 45 minutes with your next pick, not in mine. All right, so we don't have a first pick yet. I guess it's Fertile Thicket, because I like that card more than Brad. Uh, it's actually Snapping Arlid. <laughs> it's the one It's the one that lets you look at the top five, four or five cards, four, uh, five cards, so and pick I a line. Take Evolving Wilds over that. I would take Snapping Gnarlet over both of those cards, but I would take Evolving Wilds over that. I would take Sky Spawner over all of those cards. Yeah, I would definitely take Sky Spawner over all those cards. Rot Shambler is fine. I'm taking Wind Rider Patrol over. That guy is hard to beat. Yes, this lady is a powerful Merfolk wizard, and she's uh, actually riding the, the eel. You remember from the original Zendikar? Or, sorry. Oh, yeah, the okay. three mana. Oh, come on, focus. It's fine. Ah, well, I gotta shake my hand up for a second anyway. Keeping your hand in one position is a little bit numbing. Anyway, let's see if there's anything else we're gonna pick over that. Um, there is not. I would take Veteran War Leader over a lot of mid powered cards, but the uh, Flyer's high enough powered that I'd prefer it. Even oh, yeah, though I'd the, much rather have the Flyer. Incubator Drone is a fine first pick, but not exciting. Let's see if we can find something exciting for you guys. I take the. Uh, I take the Incubator Drone over the Coral Helm. Hmm. I'm not sure I am on that pick yet. I don't know if I take Incubator Drone or Coral Home Guide first. Uh, I would 
probably take the incubator drum, but it's very close. I'm not sure if that's right either. All right, let's keep going. There's still nothing beating the incubator drone. Sheer drop. I'm on sheer drop. I'm still on sheer drop. It might be sheer drop. Um, I think I might start with the brutal explosion just because bouncing something and killing something is nice. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure how good brutal explosion is because I haven't played it yet. So that's where I'm at on brutal exp explosion. Question mark. Is this the last pack? Last pack. Last pack. Last chance for glory. Let's uh, focus in. Anticipate. Spoiler alert. <laughs> S uh, focus in. Yeah, it's... Sludge Crawler. Incubator Drone, first pick. Cholestra Healer. Mankindi Patrol. Nettle Drone. Slide Runner. Smite. Channeler. I like the Channeler. Vestige. Retreat. Sky Rider. Encircling Fissure. Part the Water Bell, which you actually do not first pick. It's only okay in certain decks. Mountain. And nothing. We didn't get anything super sweet. I think the first pick in that one was a uh, Smite. I don't know. I think I would take the Kozlik guy over that. The uh, the one that taps for two mana. Yeah, that's a fair thing, too. It's hard to say which. Um, so we're going to pull out the rares and kind of see what we got there. So I'm going to set the big money rares over here so you guys can see them. Let's see if we can get a good angle on that. Mm. High value. Random foils. Foil lands. I really like the foil land. That one looks beautiful. Quarantine fills one of the cards I think actually will end up getting more value and see more play as things keep going. Part of the water valve probably will not. We'll put it in the lower tier one. Um, these are speculative ones. I know these cards are worth quite a bit. The foil lands are worth a couple five bucks or so. Do we know what Creora and Obnixilis are worth? Let's look. No, at but we can find out. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and click to. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Oh, it, it, oh, there we go. Um, Brad, can you type? Yeah, I can type. Uh, Ash, did you go through all the cards yet? Yeah, those are all the black commons. Um, Silvers, and then I have a tiny pile of the gold thingy. Oh, these is are all the, the rares? Black Oath? What is he? Battle for Zendikar Reignited. How about that? Yeah. So, he's so worth actually, 13 dollars in here, paper. Here, let's open up the prices. Go to price. I'll do this. Let's just look down the whole list. Price lists. Boom. Battle for Zendikar. Paper. And then price. 11 cents. All right, so let's see. Which of these did we get? We didn't get a Gideon, or Drana, Ulamog. We got the fourth most expensive card in the Obnixilis, which is nice. Uh, we got a Kiora, which is on there too. Wow, a lot of these cards are kind of low. We got yeah, a bunch of these lands. a lot lands. of people were, were saying that, you know, the value's all in Gideon at this point, or will soon be. Um, I think that Planar Outburst will be going up, even though it's not yet. Let's see. We got some of the lands. Let's pull up yeah. the cards that were... Uh, I think you should probably get rid of everything at this point since you're not going to play any of them. This is right. Well, I'm not playing standard right now. so I'll, I'm probably not playing standard again. So. Yeah, Brad jumps in and out of standard as he pleases. No, no, I think I'm just going to stick with modern. It's just more fun. We have a local shop that plays a lot of modern. So the cards we actually got that are worth five or more dollars. Oh, Shambling Vent is worth five or more dollars. What does that one do? Oh, it's the land. Yeah, um, it probably means if it's not yet, then soon to be Lumbering Falls will be too. Just have to wait for it to get there. Uh, some of these cards will be going up. Um, just we'll know they'll see play later. But uh, yeah, oh yeah, Lumbering Falls is $3. The other one was 5 Um We got a lot of $3 cards here and there, this and that. But the big value cards are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are all this is a $35 in cards. It's another... 13 on top of that, 35, which is like 48, and then 58. So we probably have $58 of like actual cards and value. I paid $103 for the box. Mm, so you probably, you could probably sell them to our local shop for about 30 bucks. So. Yeah, I mean, I might speculate on weight on some of this or not. Um, selling your cards at the right time That's is a key huge, part. That's yeah. It is. Um, that I might, being said, all the ones you have, I think, are only going to go down in value. Uh, I think Obnixilis might go up as he sees more play. He hasn't seen a lot of play yet. Uh, Kiora will go up if she has a deck. 
Which we won't know for a while. Oh, okay. So, in the long run, Battle for Zendikar will go up because all these other cards are rotate out. But I'm talking about in the next two weeks, I think all the cards are going to slump down. Yeah. More. Okay, that's a fair assessment. They will go down in the short term because of that, but... Let's turn this around so you guys can see me and Brad blathering on. That's an even worse angle than we usually have. I love it. Okay. Um, just right up our nostrils. Perfect. That's what you got. And my eyes are actually made out of light. You guys might not know this. I actually just wear contacts. It makes them quite have eyes. But anyway, uh, I don't have an impetus to need money right now, so why not wait a few months? Mm, okay. I mean, in That's fine. I thought you were going to, like... You know, buy another box and keep doing this. I, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm not man. buying any magic. I, I need a place to put these. I already have plenty of cards. But, like, you yeah. know, you're sitting on uh-huh. some boxes, but uh-huh. you don't want to sell them now. You want to just Oh, wait. well, they're not of the new set, no. No, and they're not so. decreasing in value. Yeah, these will slump down and then uh, rise back up after cons rotates. Most of these cards will be much stronger when the four-color set is out, or the three-color set. But the fact that we have a three-color set with strong cards in every color, I mean, none of these cards are as good as a... a Siege Rhino or a uh, Mantis Rider for the most part. Mm. No. And you can tell that in the prices. There's a couple of exciting cards. Uh, I expect Gideon to remain pricey. Drana might. If- Actually, Gideon may go up. Did you yeah. see how many copies there were in the Pro Tour? It was very good. So. But yeah, Gideon, Drana, I'd hold on. I would get rid of those. Or I would get rid of Gideon because I think he'll go down pretty quick. Um, oh, so I actually think he might go up in the short, short term. But I don't think you're going to get any more money for him when he goes up. Yeah, yeah he question. Might go. Uh, okay, so the question we have is, I'm going to be starting Magic in the next month once I get money. There sh- where should I start to collect cards? I've gotten experience in mainly Hearthstone, and I'm learning to play uh, using Magic Duels and Magic 2015. There's a couple of different things to think here. First of all, what kind of play experience do you work? Do you want? I would recommend, unless you're a highly competitive player, to start in a casual group to find a card store and play with casual people. Uh, you can have a lot it's of fun. To stay in the camera here. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of. It, there's a lot of ways you can play fun magic without being competitive. Competitive magic is an expensive game. Yes, very expensive actually. If you're going to start starting now, um, competitively is a good time. The fetch lands from the thing before, the ones you tap to sacrifice a land, are very cheap, and they're the cards you'll play through your entire experience. You'll probably Start playing by standard, and eventually graduate to uh, modern. That said, um, to find out if you like it, I would recommend starting in a monocolor aggressive deck. Right now there is a red Artarka deck. I don't know the exact price on the deck, but we can look it up right now. Yeah, um, that's actually really easy. You go to standard, down a little bit. Standard. No, it's, it's under oh, decks. Oh, it's under decks? Okay. Decks, metagame. So let's look at the uh, standard Atarka Red. I think it's red green, but you could probably play it mono red. And I would just look at yeah, you open it in another tab. So you can tell all the prices. Now, ooh, it's two hundred and one deck dollars. Yeah, so it's four hundred five dollars to just buy the deck. Where's most of that? Uh, most of that money seems to be in Hangerback Walker, actually. Wow. What? Well, yeah, so you shouldn't feel bad about buying these fetch lands because if you continue to play Magic and go into Modern, other things, it'll be good layover. I would probably start with a mono red version and skip on a couple of the expensive cards uh, to see if you like it, play a couple tournaments. And if you enjoy playing Magic, then invest more. I would not buy a $400 deck and then find out you don't like Magic. Yeah, um, try it with just all red cards and then, you know, a lot of uh, uncommons and commons you can probably get for free. Just by asking people. Oh, you here know, we go. They, play they have a hashtag budget decks. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, here's the thing. If you start playing, you're either going to be playing um, online, which is cheaper to get into, but you can't get your money really back out completely of, or your FNM, which will be a little bit more friendly and I think a better place to start. Uh, FNM will be at your local kind of playing store. Yep, the LGS. Perfect. And standard play style. That, so. He's saying here that he has a local SGS. Uh, Ulamog's Exile deck. Would you remember that after long? This one, actually the one you saw you liked, is a perfect deck right here. It's a budget deck. Throwing down $100 for deck might seem like a lot, but you can often get a lot of that back. And like the Wasteland Stranglers, you might not have to 
do a lot to get those. You might be easier to get those than 36 cents. Yeah. It might be kind of hard to get a couple of Ulamogs, but I expect this card to go down. Um, and really, it's the only card worth money. And the well, good news so is... So that's online, so if you go to paper, it's going to be a little bit more. A little bit more. But again, Oblivion <laughs> Sower... If you look at Ulamog. the prices for this one, though, you'll notice all the money is basically an Ulamog. Ulamog and Oblivion, uh, Oblivion Sower, which is fine. Like, most of these cards, you can maybe even get almost free. People will probably give you silk wraps if you're a noon starting player. Yeah. A lot of times a friendly store can get you uh, most of that. And if you don't want to buy the Cave of Coleoses right now or they're hard to find, you could, you know, do something you can yeah. play the, the tap lands. There's a lot of different ways to do this. But this is the kind of deck I would start out with something that you think looks interesting and that fits a moderate to low budget. I mean Brad has quite a bit of money in magic, but he didn't start off by spending a whole bunch of money. He worked his way up to it. One deck he liked at a time. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, you were happy with the purchases because you knew what you are making. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Just wanted to play more Magic. And another good point to put out is that... Uh, uh, Ox, I would not recommend buying a booster box. It's more of a gamble. The reason I bought a booster box is to open for you guys. It's fun. That's cool. But if you're looking to spend a budgeted amount to get into Magic, you're better off buying singles or trading for singles with people. Yep. Uh, that is the most cost-efficient way to get in. Yeah, I mean, opening packs is definitely fun. But if you're just looking in to get in for cheap, uh, just TCG Player or your local game store is probably way easier. I'm a proponent way cheaper. of starting at your local game store just because, you know, they got to have money to operate. Um, everyone has a different threshold at what they think is appropriate, whether it's 5 10 15 20% higher than what they get another card. But as far as your commons and uncommons go, you really won't be saving that much money ordering online, and your yeah. local card store will have them. Yeah, and they might just give them to you for free. Oh, yeah, if you make a big purchase, if you bought this whole deck from them, they'd probably just make you pay for, like, the Sowers, the Ulamogs, and some of the more pricey cards. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to remember is some of these cards will rotate over into other stuff. We saw the fetch lands, um, and those those fetch lands, right? Brad has a place set of uh, all the fetch lands, but, like, a lot of the lands you own for modern... They have gained in value. You've made money off of some of the cards. That's true. Uh, as far as buying a deck builder's box for lands and extra cards, I would probably just buy the uh, Battle for Zendikar Fat Pack. Uh, that'll give you some packs, and it'll give you the full art lands, which you'll be wanting pretty soon. Uh, so you'll get a large, a large amount of your money back from buying that with full art lands. Yeah, and if you don't, you don't need to do that anyway. People will give you lands. If yeah. you told your local game shop person that you wanted to start playing Magic, they would happily give you 20 they, of each of the lands. And, and they might actually have those you know, new player starting decks or whatever they're called. I think I would stick with the uh, the fat packs. The fat packs for this set are yeah. full art and they're That's true. really nice. But, but they might, those have lands in them though, those free sample learn to play Magic decks. So You yeah. usually don't need to buy a, a deck builder's toolbox for lands. If you want some of the cards, then you might want to buy it, but you really should talk to more people at your local game store before you do that. Awesome. Um, as you can see, the site up here is MTG Goldfish. But if you just type in uh, modern standard budget decks, you'll see a list of a lot of different stuff. Uh, there's a site called MTG Salvation. Or MTG Goldfish, <laughs> the one we're using. Well, yeah, MTG Goldfish is good for like currently being played stuff. MTG Salvation has a lot of uh, brewing people, and they brew a lot of cheap decks. And um, the reason decks are expensive is because they've performed well before. But there are often powerful decks that are very cheap. They just haven't been found yet. And a lot of their uh, powerful decks that are cheap uh, are the basis for building into the better decks that are already being played. So they have a lot of the same cards, just the cheaper ones. So yeah, you just take one step at a time as your budget and as your comfort level um, permits, and you'll get to a position that you're happy with. I do not recommend going in deep on Magic. Sometimes people just find out they don't like it or you, you don't like the you don't play like environment. The <laughs> Sometimes some of the... some. Stores have obnoxious people. I personally don't go to stores where I don't like the people, and I'll frequent stores I do. I do. You know, we have the luxury of making that choice because our city has like four or five game stores. Yeah, we have a lot within driving distance. There's probably six within driving distance. I imagine yeah. not all of them are big enough that I would actually play Friday Night Magic at them. Right, and I'm the opposite. I don't mind playing a really small one because I'm playing more for the experience and less for the prizes. Brad's playing more for the prizes and. The experience that he has playing, but not the experience he gets as much for them the, the other players. Yeah, I really don't like the other players. Any I'm of just them. saying that, but no. Uh, no, I actually do like most of our uh, game stores around here, uh, 
and I wouldn't go to one if I didn't like the people there and the people that owned it. So, yeah, Ox, um, that is a little bit of money on Hearthstone. Uh, one other thing I recommend for Magic. I haven't it, spent much less. So yeah, well, <laughs> you spend a lot of money on Magic cards too. You just you. Yeah, we're not gonna fathom how much I've spent on Magic yeah. though. Uh, one thing that I know a lot of people do, uh, there are other podcasts on um, sort of finances for it, but setting a financial amount that you spend a weekly or monthly kind of an allowance for yourself for Magic can help because Magic can get very expensive and the you can want to buy stuff very quickly if you don't have good impulse control than just setting yourself a solid budget and then having it roll over, right? Well, let's say you want a $20 card and that you spend $10 a week on Magic. Well, you don't buy anything the first week and the second week you buy your $20 card can set you up for a position where you're not overspending on Magic. It can be a very expensive game. Um, also, a lot of uh, game stores, when you play Friday Night Magic, will give you a pack. And so you might just open something good in that pack. Yeah, they'll have different payouts. Um, my favorite payout for new stores is to have two packs. One pack is open. You get to see the rare. So the winning player gets the most valuable shown rare. And everyone gets a pack underneath. And that pack's a random value. Now, that's not normally as good for a player that's very, very good because they're getting less potential and probable value. But the newer players get a better experience. And for me, Friday Mag Mag Magic is all about new players enjoying themselves. There are higher level events for higher level players. Mm -hmm. And that's where the highest level of competition and seriousness belongs. Friday Night Magic is just about having fun. And those are definitely fun once you get to that level. Oh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Once you're a state-level runner, it's really different than uh, running track against your buddies. All right, guys, uh, I think that's going to close up shop for today. Uh, Ox, thanks for the good question, man. And We're good luck with your magic experience. Yeah, we'll be here. Um, I think we'll be... Probably streaming. tomorrow if you can. Yeah, we'll be doing something tomorrow. Um, Hopefully it'll... drafting. I want to draft this All right, again. We'll, we'll, we'll try to find time to throw in another magic draft. We'll be doing an MTGO draft. Uh, the uh, Rise of Eldrazi draft. I think we're going to let Battle Brad... Battle for Zendikar. Battle, Battle for Zendikar. Zendikar. Oh, my Rise gosh. Eldrazi. Uh, I'm going to let Brad pilot again, see if we can get another big deck, and then if we need to, we will audible into one of the other many, many available decks. Yeah, we were open to it last time. It worked out pretty well. Eventually, we're going to start getting an 8-4 cues once we get better. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the when to swap over from Swiss to 8-4s next time we get on, but for now, Mobius...